Hi there, I'm Rob Black. I'm a lecturer in information activities at Cranfield University down at the Defence Academy. I'm also the director of the UK Cyber 912 Strategy Challenge and I also do some work for the UK Foreign and Commonwealth Development Office uh, at Wilton Park where I help encourage policy dialogues on relevant topics in cyber intelligence and warfare. Well, if I think about my uh, career, I'm a bit of an imposter when it comes to cyber security. If I'm honest, I feel like a bit of an imposter. Um, I don't come from a technical cybersecurity background, and I think that's one of the fundamental points I would like to highlight is that you don't need to have an in-depth technical uh, discipline or career to become a, someone who contributes fully to a cybersecurity profession or have a career in cybersecurity. So I actually started off doing a law degree at university, and then I did a master's in international relations and international law, and I didn't know what I wanted to do. I thought about joining the civil service. Um, ended up becoming a, a strategic analyst for the Ministry of Defence, part of the Ministry of Defence that thinks about you know, the difficult questions, how are we going to fight wars in the future, what does operating in space look like, um, and I did a range of different activities, none of which were to do with cyber. A lot of them were to do with understanding how our adversaries might make sense of the world and how they might decide to act and what we might do to influence them. I did some work chasing pirates off the African coast. Uh, when we had all the pirates from some off, off the coast of Somalia, I was working with the the coalition of navies planning how we were going to protect this huge sweat stretch of water and all the ships traveling through it did some work at the olympic security looking at how we could make sure the strategic security risks that affected london in 2012 could be addressed well in advance of any threat assessments we might be able to conduct and yeah i did a variety of different projects and programs that got me thinking about strategy and policy risk assessments business continuity and so on and then in about 2011 2012 I had this dawning realization that actually warfare was going to change significantly and the way states engage with each other is going to change significantly because of how um, we were connected. The global, globalization, the internet age, the age of being connected to everyone everywhere came around and this was going to massively shape how things were happening. And I got involved helping pull through some of the MOD's research program into cyber operations, thinking about how do we understand how people react to each other through computers, computer mediated communications. I'm talking to you now through a computer screen. How do I build trust with you? How do you take indicators of trust from a website? How do you take indicators of trust from an email? And then how do we make sure individuals are being you know, effectively inoculated against cybersecurity threats that might be occurring against them and how the UK might choose to conduct cyber operations in a way that enabled it to be a responsible actor in cyberspace and could project statecraft tools and techniques and aspects of warfare that included this virtual cyber domain and before i knew it i was involved in cyber loving it enjoying it because it was a fascinating topic and something i hadn't really considered before so my, my roles currently now are very much focused at the intersect between cyber national security and defense um, and the relationship between cyber and intelligence and cyber and warfare so i have a great role down at the defense academy where i teach our military personnel to think about the, the geopolitical aspects of cyber cyber security so if we were to be attacked in cyberspace, the UK as a whole, or even an organization in the UK, does that amount to warfare? Can we respond with force? Should we only respond with cyber? What are the rules we have to apply when we're fighting in cyberspace? Do we have to observe the Geneva Conventions as if it's in warfare? Um, but also, how do we build capabilities up that can protect us against cyber threats? And how do we share those with others? How do we make sure we can act in accordance with others and operate effectively in a cyber enabled age? And that is an area that I find absolutely fascinating looking at the aspects of the legality of war the concepts of war is cyber warfare is it covert action is it like sabotage in the modern age is it part of intelligence are we using cyber differently to how we do intelligence and, and how do all those issues weave together when we think about how we operate and what rules we need to follow that fits really nicely with one of my other roles which is as the associate program director down at wilton park and in that role i i focus on bringing events together or creating events dialogues amongst the policy community representatives from governments around the world where we think about the issues that are pertinent to UK's national or foreign objectives and national priorities. So for me, we find events on thinking about what does the concept we've identified in the national cyber strategy of being a responsible cyber actor, what does that look like? What does that mean? How does a nation state become a responsible cyber actor? Can an organization, a private sector body become a responsible cyber actor? Do they have different sets of rules for them about who they can work with and what they can do in cyberspace? And does that reflect differently on the nation state? And how does the nation state build capability up in one area and consider about other operations activities that it might need to do as well to remain, maintain its freedom of maneuver? So all of these issues are new, exciting issues in the international community because cyber is such a fresh domain, a virtual domain that's been around for 10, 20 years. And it's so different to all the other domains of operations. You know, if you think about air power, air war, um, land war and tanks, 
very different when it comes to cyberspace because we're in a man-made environment man-made virtual environment that we have to think about how we interact and we don't or we're not necessarily confined by the same rules of physics as we were before or the rules of geography i can operate through cyber in a nation that i'm not connected to physically i can conduct activities and i can be an attacker based in you know, a country in asia and they can focus on attacking organizations or government services in the uk or individuals in the uk or the us and so how does that you know, how does that fit? How does our international community deal with and respond to these issues? And there's loads of fascinating work at the UN and at the international you know, community level, NATO, but also in bilats between different states, thinking about how we put these norms and rules of behavior in place so that we can make sure we're all acting properly and we're encouraging those other states to act properly or dissuading them from taking advantage of the, of the opportunity that cyber provides. So for me, sitting in that space, these two roles allow me to really think about why is cyber different to everything else? And how do we encourage a common set of thinking, a common set of rules for operating in cyberspace? So one of the other roles I have is the director of the UK Cyber 912 Strategy Challenge, which is a great initiative looking at building the next generation of cybersecurity leaders. And these leaders need to be competent in not only the technical aspects of cyber, but they need to be thinking strategy and policy. So this initiative is for university students based around the UK to come together and compete in teams of four and participate as if they're advisors to the, to the UK cabinet office during the time of an escalating cyber crisis. And what we encourage these students to do is to recognize that they need to lift their heads up from the technical solution. The technical solution itself is important, but there are other factors they need to consider. And we'll give them a hypothetical but plausible scenario that they have to face and they have to think about how they're going to give advice to the government about what they need to do to respond. And we, we really encourage students who come from a technical cybersecurity discipline to get involved, participate, practice those soft human centric skills, the complementary skills, effective decision making, critical analysis, effective briefing and communication skills, but also to get them to see that they need to lift their heads up and look beyond the technical answer. And the other area we really focus on is about empowering other students from other disciplines who might not necessarily see themselves as a technical expert in cyber, but they need to recognize that they can make a valuable contribution and the skills they're learning in their university roles are equally relevant and transferable into cybersecurity. And as I said before, I do feel like a little bit of an imposter in cybersecurity because I don't have a technical background, but there are so many roles out there that do not require an in-depth technical specialism. And we usually overlook them when we talk about cyber because we think about technical cyber. But there's policy roles, there's governance roles, there's strategy roles. There's a whole set of different roles where we need people who have got those competencies to effectively brief seniors, to advise boards, to avoid external customers and clients to think about the broader issues and think about how the strategy they're implementing is going to work and deal with the situation at hand. And that's very much where we've had some great successes of the Cyber 912 Strategy Challenge, bringing students from other disciplines, arts, philosophy, geography, you name it, and seeing them participate, contribute fully as part of a multidisciplinary team, and then be excited by the idea of a prospect of a career in cyber and go on and work in interesting cyber roles. And that, for me, is one of the highlights. Alongside that competition element of it, we also facilitate lots of opportunities for students to meet with and connect with representatives from industry, government, and even academia, so they can learn about all the variety of different options that there are for a career in cyber. And it's great to have the support of the UK community. We've got some great partners, great sponsors, great government champions. So we bring in a whole holistic mix of people who are working in cybersecurity so our students can meet with them, learn from them, learn about some of the exciting roles, and hopefully end up working with them and working for them in the future. And I have to say, it's great to have Crest as a partner in this competition. We're really grateful for your support and some of the efforts you've done to encourage the competition for us as well. So I guess if I look at the daily life of the director of the Cyber912 Strategy Challenge, um, I've got a great team of people by me. So I have a team of people coordinating the development of the scenario. I have a great um, social media and comms team who do a lot of outreach online. I have a team who are doing student engagement and outreach, again, reaching out to student communities, societies, different schools, universities to get them involved, make them aware of the competition. So my role pretty much is set to coordinate those activities and make sure that um, they're all up and running and that we're you know, engaging with the right students to get them involved or as many students as possible to get them involved. And then I take on the responsibility primarily for engaging with our sponsors and our government champions and our partners to make sure we've got a great team um, behind us at the event. So on the event itself, we have a team of representatives from our sponsors, our, um, our government partners and, and other champions who, who come in and volunteer their time to act as, um, as if they're kind of seniors in the government receiving these briefings and advising the students as to how, how plausible their courses of action and their suggestions were, where they could improve their briefing skills and so on. And I work with a team 
Um, again, coordinating all that activity, seeking sponsorship, because unfortunately there are costs involved that we need to cover, but also seeking uh, you know, activities for students to do alongside the competition. They might receive a briefing from one organisation, there might be a, an interactive session in there elsewhere, we might create some prizes for the students, there might be a visit to uh, one of the sponsors, home organisations, to see what a day in the life is there. And so I spend my time kind of coordinating with the sponsors, the partners and the rest of my team to make sure everything is set up and running for the event that we have, which is usually in the February period so we do a lot of work in terms of prepping for that. I am probably might sound like a broken record but I think it's about encouraging people to see that cyber security isn't just about technical cyber, it's fascinating in the technical space and it really is interesting for many students but a lot of people find it a little bit daunting and a little bit over, overbearing in this technical aspect but cyber is so much more than that and I think the challenge for us in the community is to get schools and universities to recognise the breadth of cyber security and that actually to give teachers at schools confidence that it isn't just to be left to the IT teacher, it isn't just to be left to the computer science teacher, and that you can think about cyber in different ways. The politics students can talk about cyber in terms of cyber warfare. Does a particular attack mean that the UN gets involved? Does it mean that a nation can respond with force? That's, that's a relevant conversation you could be having in a history class or a politics class, nothing to do with necessarily the technical aspects. So we need to empower the schools to make them feel comfortable integrating cyber across the board in all of the topics, all of the disciplines. If I was thinking about me coming into a cybersecurity career now, what I would find most useful, I think is actually understanding the breadth, breadth of the community and the fact that there aren't just necessarily set disciplines and set roles. This is still quite a new discipline. Everyone who is in cybersecurity today probably didn't think they were gonna be doing cyber when they were at university because quite a few of them, unless they're really recent grads, we were at university in an age where cyber wasn't even a term that was being used. So they've all had to create roles and explore roles and discover roles that have got cyber in them without necessarily being set on a path where cyber is the clear answer for them. Now we're seeing students going, you know what, I really like cybersecurity, I really like this, I'm gonna get involved in it. But actually be comfortable exploring what aspects of the role you like. Don't necessarily just look at a role and say, it's this, it's that. Do I want to be engaging with stakeholders? Do I want to be engaging with my team? Do I want, want to work in a team and technically address a problem and work to finish a problem and then deliver a product? Or am I happy thinking about strategic issues at the top and thinking about how we deal with these difficult issues or engaging with this stakeholder over here or that stakeholder over there? So actually spend time thinking about what type of skills you have and what kind of activities you enjoy doing. And then at that point, recognize that within cybersecurity, there are a variety of different roles and different types of careers that you can have and start matching what you like doing to those types of roles. So the first one I'm going to recommend is Dark Neck Diaries as a podcast series. They have some great articles and great episodes where they break down particular attacks. They meet interesting people from the community and they get to talk to them about their roles, whether it be um, social engineers. You know, um, Jenny Radcliffe has been on, been interviewed about some of her experiences as a social engineer, um, through to talking about some of the major attacks and what happened, whether it be not Petya or some of the Shamoon attacks in the past. And it gives you a really nice digestible story to understand about the attack and why it was important and what the key issues were and what the technical aspects were. So I'd recommend that podcast. Um, I'd also recommend the Risky Business podcast, which is a podcast um, hosted by an Australian who talks about cyber and some of the latest developments in cyber. So it's great to be able to keep on top of some of the developments and, and progresses. Um, and then broader than that, I think there are a few website based resources which I'd recommend. Um, it would be remiss of me not to mention Cyber First and the National Cyber Security Centre more broadly. They've got a range of different resources for people thinking about careers in cyber, but thinking about how to be more cyber secure themselves and in their organisation. And if you're working in an organisation that's thinking, God, where do I even start with cyber? I'd go to the NCSC website. And if you're an individual thinking about what career do I want to have? I'm not sure what I'm going to do in cyber, check out Cyber First at the NCSC because they've got some fantastic resources. They've got some fantastic competitions and initiatives um, that you should get part of as well, to be honest. And they're a great, they're a great team, a great resource, and I'd definitely encourage that. And then beyond that, the other resources I would I'd refer to are more the geopolitical aspects of, of cyber security and cyber warfare. And I'd encourage you to go and visit the NATO. Uh, there's a Center for Cyber Defense, Center of Excellence. Um, and it's based over in Tallinn, but they have loads of resources online and they run a conference every year called SciComm. And all of the talks, all of the papers from those conferences are up online and also some of the materials they produce, papers they produce and so on are released on there as well. So I'd recommend that, that library and that resource there, the NATO CCD COE. Um, and then also I'd recommend um, a couple of other international cyber law and cyber kind of toolkits. Um, there's a great international cyber law toolkit, which has been supported by a couple of organizations, including uh, the International Committee of the Red Cross. So Google the, that and you'll find some really interesting um, 
resources that break down what the cyber norms are that are trying to be established in the international community, some inc incidents or examples of some of the cyber incidents and what implications they might have, and some of the laws that are existing out there that need to apply or could be applied in cyberspace. So again, it gives you a really interesting set of materials to work through and talk through. And then the EU have a cyber dis diplomacy toolkit as well, which I'd really encourage you to look at.